Welcome to the JiraCon, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great time attending the sessions. And uh, thank you, all of you, for joining us for uh, this session as well. My name is Sanyukta, and I'm a business analyst in Mini Orange. Hi, I'm Gaurav, and I'm the head architect here at Mini Orange. Uh, let me tell you a brief about Mini Orange. Uh, so basically, Mini Orange uh, provides a secure and uh, reliable identity and access management solutions that uh, integrate seamlessly with different frameworks like uh, Atlassian, Drupal, Joomla, and WordPress. Moving ahead with today's session. Uh, so today we'll uh, be talking about the better cybersecurity posture in the organization, including Jira as the core component. Before we get started, I'm going to go through some housekeeping to ensure that uh, you are able to uh, interact with us smoothly. Firstly, if you wish to ask uh, any questions to us, uh, you can type it in the chat box, and uh, we will also be taking uh, we'll also be taking questions at the end. Uh, throughout the session, we'll be launching the polls, and we invite you to participate by replying uh, to those polls uh, when they appear on your screen. Without much further ado, let's get straight into today's agenda. Now, let me ask you a question: What do you think? Or do you believe that your organization is secure? Let's take an example. Here's our house. And if you want to secure it, what would we do? Maybe start with a fence around the yard. Put a lock on the door. Or put some security cameras so that we can monitor as people come in. And place an angry dog behind the fence to give us a little bit of extra assurance. Now, do you feel secure? Do you see the problem with the security? Okay, wait, let me tell you. Well, it assumes that the intruder is on the outside. But what if the intruder is inside your house, lying on your sofa, drinking your soda, and ordering up pay-per-view movies? Then it is going to be a problem. We cannot be dependent on the security controls that we were relying on. Now, let's see what believing in current security framework looks like. It actually looks like that we were trying to protect something that was not supposed to be protected. Let's apply the same example to an IT firm. Let's think of a typical web architecture where we have, uh, where we have a user with a browser or a mobile device, and they're using this to traverse a network to hit a web server, which, is, uh, which then hits an application server and then a database. Now, what we might do in terms of general security practices uh, would be to put a firewall, which will limit the access. So that is the person here on the outside who cannot directly get into the sensitive stuff that is on the inside. Now, let's think in terms of a traffic light. The red zone is the untrusted one. Now, we have a green zone, which we consider trusted. And then we have a section in the middle of a semi-trusted that we call the demilitarized zone, which is the DMZ. So how, how is it similar to when we protected the house? It's like assuming that the intruder is on the outside. But what if it's already inside? Then all of a sudden, the green zone is another untrusted zone. In fact, I have to assume that everything is, whatever is there is untrusted. Now, do you see that number on your screen? These number, these are the numbers of cyber attacks that occurred last year. 60 million. What could have been worse? Now, taking into account that we were just hit by a pandemic, cyber crimes have increased to a whooping 600%. There are password breaches, phishing, and brute, brute force attacks contribute to a major chunk of these cyber crimes. In the initial shift to remote and distributed workforces, many companies were ill-prepared. In the rush to become operational, organizations actually fail to consider the cybersecurity implications of working in a remote environment. Let's take you to the solution. Zero trust. At this point, my co-host Gaurav will take you over and get right down to the meat of things. Over to you, Gaurav. Hello, Ken. In this segment, I will explain to you, hype and break down to you what zero trust is, the business drivers behind it, and the benefits it can bring. We'll also explore a formalized architecture towards zero trust setup, some approaches to zero trust, what the journey feels like while implementing zero trust through Jira, and share some common pitfalls and challenges along the way. 
Now, what is zero trust? Like the name suggests, zero trust is no trust security strategy to protect resources in the internal network and to have a better cybersecurity posture in the organization. It assumes, like the name says, that a breach has already been occurred in that network and it formulates a set of practices that prevent breach of sensitive data as well as lack of access to some protected resources. Strategies proceed with the inherent principle that the communication between resources in the network cannot be implicitly trusted, like the name rightly suggests. Now what zero trust is not? Let's look at a few things, what it does not denote. As the name suggests, I cannot give you a zero trust solution. It is not a software suite, but a set of standards and best practices. The standards are also not set in stone and can be customized to an extent based on what the organization needs and what its objectives are. The needs can be something as simple as recovering from a previous ransomware attack and the objective can be to mitigate that and recover uh, from it. Now, there are a few reasons why organizations are looking at a zero trust cybersecurity strategy. Let's look at those driving forces. We have few of them listed down. So yeah, we can go ahead and look at them one at a time. Now, parameter-based security is ineffective. Now, in a network access in a traditional workplace is tightly linked to a user's identity. That may not be the case in a hybrid workplace, which a lot of organizations are rapidly transitioning to in a post-pandemic world. As we saw in the previous slides, credential theft is one of the leading cyber crimes. Credentials to get onto an internal network, probably through a VPN, is not proof enough of identity, as they may be stolen or shared, like we saw earlier. Thus, access to an internal protected resources should never be granted solely on the basis of having access to the network. As the slide suggests, we can't really put a boundary for information sharing in a hybrid environment. And there are very fuzzy perimeters if the employees trying to access resources from different networks. Surely, there needs to be something more to gauge the identity and access rights of users. Now, the second is the cloud supply chains cannot be implicitly trusted. Let's take the example of a public water filtration system. Contamination at any single point in the system can lead to contamination of the entire system. Think of solar winds. Single malware which impacted solar winds exploited a vulnerability and that ended up affecting thousands of solar wind customers and is still doing so, causing them losses and endless heartaches. And if any segment in, any, in the supply chain gets affected, it can affect the entire infrastructure. That's pretty common. Third point is least privileged access in the network. Simply put, users should not have unfettered access to protected resources in your infrastructure. They should only have the level of access that they need, and that too, at the time they need it, rather than at the end of time. Not everything within a trusted environment or network is secure. We simply cannot trust all communication within the, within the entire internal network. That is what the principle guide. If there are bad actors already present in the network, the infrastructure needs to be resilient enough to mitigate loss of sensitive data as well as to limit what harm the bad actors, which are already present in the network, what they really can do. Now, we take the case of bring your own devices. Employees in a hybrid work environment may connect to protected resources from untrusted networks or devices. Let's take the case of a, an internal database admin and whether he tries to access the internal database from the local Starbucks for that matter and that too, connecting on an open network, and that too, on his personal device. Who else may be listening onto the open network? What compromising software does the admin have installed on the device? Simply put, we cannot assure the security of the network or the device. Now, moving on to some guiding principles of what zero trust is. Let's jump in. The first one is the most common one. Never trust, always verify. Anything on the network is not to be trusted. 
we should never trust the communication between the resources. The basic print principle is that each request must have a level of authentication. Who is making the request? An, an authorization layer, whether that resource has an access level to make the request or not. The second principle assumes that the environment has already been breached. The communication between the systems and services should always assume this and still be able to protect your sensitive information. As we saw a little earlier, each request needs to be authenticated and authorized. This also needs to continuously happen across all communication between the resources and services in the network. Access to these resources after an appropriate level of authentication and authorization needs to be granted and that too at a minimum, minimum access level so as to protect against an unrestricted access to those resources. Now that that we have that, that in mind, we can look at a few components which make up a zero trust. What we're seeing here is an architecture of a zero trust system as formalized by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It may look a little overwhelming at first, but let me make it somewhat simple for you. Remember the house analogy that Sayaka mentioned earlier? Assume that you're an avid art collector and you have added a personal gallery with artifacts worth millions. What measures can you take to protect this collection? I can suggest a few things. First, you can have a single entry and exit point for your gun. That can be a door. You can also add verification systems such as your password, your pin systems, or even biometrics to those two. You can also add similar set setup for your artifacts in the gallery. You can also add security cameras to strategic points in the gallery. One last thing you can do is you can add a mechanism to lock down the gallery itself or, and as well as lo no, notify the law enforcement in case there is any unauthorized act. So now that we have that picture in mind, let's look at some key points in the architecture a little, uh, in a little le less detail. The dollar entities which are mentioned in that diagram, these are the resources that you really want to protect. The user information and biometrics are stored maybe on a database or any, any server for that matter. There are also systems where the user can enter their actual credentials, the password, pin, and biometrics to gain access to the same protected resources. You can also have a level of auditing of those access events. Keeping the sequence in mind, let's look at those key components of the design. The first thing we need to look at is the policy engine. It is the ultimate decision maker for allowing or denying access to a resource based on some configured policies and rules. It com communicates with a centralized identity, identity system where the credentials and policy information is stored to basically validate whether people are who they claim to be and to eventually grant or deny the access. In our scenario of the gallery, it is the end server making decisions to allow or deny access to the artifacts. And they can even allow or deny access to the gallery itself. The next thing we need to look at is the policy enforcement point, which is basically a message channel between the requester, the policy engine, and the end resource. In our gallery scenario, it was the authentication device where the user actually authenticates. They can even put in the password pin or biometrics there. The policy admin is the point where authentication and authorization policies can actually be configured. There's also a centralized identity system where all of your credentials are stored. In the gallery scenario, it stores your credentials, credentials of everyone in your family, maybe even the housekeeping and security stuff. In a real world IT scenario, it can be your internal active directory. Now there are three systems mentioned here and they all three work in, work in tandem. The SIEM system, it, it basically is responsible for generating security events based on the authentication. The login piece is basically just auditing each security event for posterity. In the gallery scenario, access to those artifacts of the gallery itself generates a sequence of events that can be audited and, and analyzed. Now there's a threat intelligence piece as well. So basically what it does is it analyzes security events and tries to determine suspicious activity. 
it can also also generate um, invoke the incident response mechanism, which in a gallery scenario was locking down the gallery and notifying the law enforcement. Now that we have that cleared up with the architecture, let's talk a few strategies for implementing zero trust in the organization. We can initially look at uh, agnostic to a class in Jira, but it can even be applied to multiple systems. Post that, we'll look at the same strategy for Jira itself. The first piece in the strategy is centralized user identity. This in a corporate setup can be the internal active directory. Now what happens next? The centralized identity is fixed on to the single sign-on suite that allows for seamless and secure access to application through the corporate identity systems. What else can you do on top of it? You can maybe add another layer of authentication such as your corporate um, FOBs or your tokens through any authenticator app such as RSA or Google or Microsoft. You can also ensure access to protect resources from just secure or trusted devices. You can also ensure access to the use of privileged access management systems so that least privileged access can be provided to users and that too at the time they need it. You can also use proxies and test solutions to ensure that you have greater visibility into um, whatever happens on your network. Finally, you can use SIEM systems to monitor security events that can be later tied to an incident response mechanism. Now that we have looked at those strategies agnostic for Jira, we can look at these components um, for Jira itself. Now we can divide them on the basis of the deployment since we look at the cloud and data center installation. For the first piece, the centralized user identity. Now the cloud model does not really provide for any inbuilt integration with Active Directory, but there are third-party integrations available. The data center model already has an inbuilt integration. The single sign-on suite. For the cloud one, it is governed through the Atlassian Access. There are third-party integrations available, which can allow you to integrate with federated identity systems. The data center model already has built-in support for federated identity systems. Again, you can always have third-party integrations available. For MFA, the cloud model has built-in support for authenticator apps and physical forms. The data center deployment achieves all of this through third-party integration. For the diagnostics and logging, systems like Splunk and Logstash are pretty popular and can be both deployed on both models. For SIEM, systems like Splunk and Datadog are pretty popular and you can use, this, use that for the same um, cloud and data center deployments. For intrus intrusion pre prevention and detection, um, for the cloud model, there is generally governed by Atlassian on their own server itself. The data center deployments can utilize systems like CrowdStrike and Checkpoint. For the proxies and CASB solutions, the most popular ones are BitClass and Sky. Now, implementing zero trust strategies really improve the cybersecurity posture of the organization. And it has a lot of benefits. Let's look at a few of them. Now, this created visibility within all activity that's happening in the network. At any point in time, we can determine what resource is being accessed and by whom, and, and whether that access is legitimate or not. Due to this visibility and the need to authenticate at each level, lateral movement can really be avoided in that network. Now, with the use of access management system, access with the least privileges granted, so that allows you to prevent breach of sensitive data due to unfettered access. With the use of MDM and device policies, you can really have better security control for all those, all those devices from which access to protected resources is, is, is granted to the users. While there are a lot of benefits that come with implementing zero trust strategies, they come with its own set of challenges and constraints. Now, the pain points generally occur due to lack of clear vision as to why zero trust has to be implemented what the end objective is, and a bit of adoption inertia. Like I said earlier, you need firm goals from the organization, the why, which can be recovering from a breach, and goals, a better security, cybersecurity posture. They need to be crystal clear before implementing a zero trust act. You cannot just dump buckets loads of money and expect instantaneous results. You 
really need proper planning and execution. You might have a lot of legacy systems in your organization. Anyone worked with those clunky banking applications? Now imagine that being part of a zero trust setup. Legacy systems are generally old and may not be in our control as well. They may be maintained by third party systems, third party vendors, making it really difficult to integrate into a proper zero trust setup. Take a few seconds to see this example. How many of us can relate to this? I surely can. Employees getting locked out due to not being assigned proper access to an application or resource, a pretty common scenario in large IT organizations. And this really gets exas exacerbated by a zero trust implementation, especially when not done properly. Now that we have looked at Jira as uh, some strategies involving Jira, we can also look at um, Jira being a fulcrum of a system governing access between systems. We can actually leverage Jira to create tickets to request additional unprivileged access. The scope of the additional access, as well as the time frame for which the access needs to be granted, um, that can be part of the ticket itself. Upon changing the ticket status, access to a particular resource can actually be granted or revoked. These events can be also be audited. Before we end the segment, let's recap what we covered. We looked at the caveats of a traditional security strategy, what zero trust is and is and is it, and some principles around it as well. Zero trust components and a formal list architecture with an alleged analogy to the art gallery, some strategies for getting zero trust in, some benefits as well as some challenges for the for a zero trust. To conclude, I'll pass it on to Sayoka. Over to you. Now that we have uh, given you uh, an overview about Zero Trust, you uh, might be wondering from where and how you should probably start implementing all of this, if the, the strategies to Jira. Well, I'll uh, let me tell you about a security suite which can help you out with it. And uh, here are the list of apps that you can use to move to a Zero Trust strategy for Atlassian Jira. By firstly, by simplifying your usernames and password management for both users and administrators by using single sign-on, which is uh, available in SAML, OAuth, and Kerberos uh, protocols. Then we have, uh, what you can do is probably add an extra layer of security using two-factor authentication and a web authn, or protect your APIs using our REST API protection apps. All of these apps are available on our class in Marketplace please feel free to reach out to us on Mini, Mini Orange's booth to know more about it. Uh, we'll now be taking questions. If you have any questions, you can uh, ask uh, on the chat box and we'll be answering it. We have a question. Uh, the question says that I would like to know the capabilities required to implement zero trust networks and uh, what plays a major role to make the network secure. So yeah, so capabilities required uh, to implement a zero trust network. So one of the key components of a zero trust network is um, like a cloud access security broker solution, which basically monitors all the traffic going through that particular CASB solution and after that, after you're able to get uh, all of that traffic in place, you can put in a threat intelligence, which basically monitors all of that, all of that traffic. And uh, you can see whether there's some suspicious activity, some users which are not supposed to be there, some uh, type of packets which are not supposed to be there. And that can uh, eventually trigger an incident response. Uh, does that answer your question? I'm not sure who asked it, but. Uh, let me know in the chat box if that answers answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. I think I think it's uh, it's answered. Do we have any more questions coming up? Okay, I think uh, if there are no other questions, I think we can end it. Uh, you can always 
ask the questions in the booth as well. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can reach uh, reach out to us on our uh, booths as well, and uh, you can uh, check out our uh, applications. And if you want to know anything about uh, our uh, application, if you like more information about it, uh, you can directly reach out uh, reach out to us on our mail ID that's on your screen. And uh, to conclude, I would uh, want to sincerely appreciate your attention for the today's session. It was an amazing response from all of you. And thank you for showing, uh, showing so much of interest. Our uh, team is always striving to make new apps and support new use cases. In case you have any other questions that are unanswered, you may visit the mini orange booth.